Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Discriminating Gamer. You know, Napoleon may not have designed the Cody War, but he did have a hand in it. Ladies and gentlemen, speaking of Napoleon, today we're going to go ahead and take a look at Waterloo, Napoleon's last battle from Companion War Games. In Waterloo, Napoleon's Last Battle from Companion War Games, two players take on the roles of Napoleon on one side and Blucher and Wellington on the other as they fight the iconic 1815 battle. Now the game board is a map of the battlefield at Waterloo. This is a tactical level game and you have various units representing the different uh, formations and they actually have actual uh, generals and, and commanders names on them attached to the various uh, units which is pretty cool. Now, you have your core commanders. You have core commander tokens along with your commander tokens, Wellington, Napoleon, Blucher, that you set aside. And these cores have different colors on them that correspond to the different colors of units on the board. So every unit that has that same kind of color at the top of their uh, unit also corresponds to that particular core commander. Now, every unit has three numbers on it. On its top left, it has its attack value. The bottom left, it has its defense value. And on the bottom right, it has its movement value. Now on the side of the board you also have a kind of a tug of war scorecard seeing who is currently winning as the score goes back and forth and you will also have kind of the impulse track that will dictate exactly whose turn it is to go and then you will have the uh, actual time of the battle, the different hours of the battle which will progress depending on how the impulses play out. Now every round you'll have the commander's phase. The French player will essentially roll die to determine whether or not Napoleon is available that turn. Napoleon has a number on it. You want to try to roll that number or greater than that number with two die. And if you do it, then Napoleon is available to give uh, various advantages to the French side that round. Next, you have the rally phase. Various commanders can try to rally units that are spent throughout the board. Uh, they can rally a number of them depending on certain factors. They roll the die and they try to bring them back into the game for the following round. Next you have the Grand Battery Phase. Now Napoleon has a massed supply of artillery kind of toward the center of the board and he can use indirect fire. Now normally you're only shooting at units that are adjacent to you that you can see directly but with indirect fire you can actually go ahead and you can roll die to try to take out um, various allied units on certain spots of the board and you have a little cannon printed on those areas where you can fire indirectly into. So if ever there are uh, Prussian or British units there you can go ahead and try to try to hit them. Now during the impulse plays, beginning with the French player and then proceeding to the uh, British and, and uh, Prussian player, can go ahead and activate his various units. Uh, essentially you're activating the core commander. Um, you've got to roll to see whether or not you can activate him. If you can't activate him, then it goes to the, the other player. The, the impulse switches to them. Um, but if you can activate it, then again, as I say, you can move and manipulate all of the units on the board <clears throat> that share the same color as that core commander. You can go ahead, you can move them and attack with them. You can do a general advance, you can do a cavalry charge, you can do all sorts of different ways to attack your enemy or just move on the board. Now there are lots of different ways you are attacking in this game, but basically what it comes down to is if you are doing kind of a general assault, you're going to take the attack value of what you call kind of your lead unit, right? You're going to take its attack value, say a four or whatever. Then you're going to add up um, different factors. You're going to look at kind of a chart. Typically, if you've got other units, they're going to add kind of a plus one to that. So if you go in with, say, four infantry units, you take one of those infantry units, look at its attack value, and then you'll get one or two points, depending on you know how you're fighting, for each other infantry unit that you add to that original attack value. So that goes ahead and adds up everything to give you your attack value for that round. 
your defender is kind of going to do the same thing. They're going to pick kind of a lead defense unit. They're going to take its defense factor, and then it's going to look at all the other different uh, units it has there and any other factors that may play into it. And critically, you're also going to look at the defense value of that particular piece of real estate. That region of the board will have its own defense value that you add on to your defense values because, of course, you're holding the ground. And then you both roll the die simultaneously. Now, whoever gets higher is going to win that combat. Whoever gets lower, of course, is going to take the difference in hit points, casualty points. You're going to distribute your casualty points amongst your different um, units. Um, you can do this either through flipping them over to their exhausted side or retreating them. But there's different things that you can do that will essentially diminish their, their power when they, when they take those hits. But as I say, there are a lot of different units. You can do a cavalry charge on open ground. Uh, you can bring in skirmishers that are going to kind of you know, give you a half point, but they can be very effective when you need them. And then, of course, as I say, you've got that artillery as well, and you can do artillery barrages uh, kind of using some of these same principles. As I say, if you attempt to activate a leader and you fail, immediately it goes to the other player. The impulse switches to the other side. Um, and then they can go ahead and they can try to activate one of their leaders. Um, you you kind of do this back and forth. You either pass or fail an impulse check, or you if, if you pass it, you uh, at the end of your impulse, you, you, the impulse passes back to the other side. And you keep going back and forth like this. So at the end of the British player's impulse, he's always going to roll a sunset die roll. He rolls two die, and if the number is equal to or greater than where the, the impulse tracker is on the impulse track, then suddenly you go to the next uh, round. The, the turn marker advances, it goes to the next round. Now, the British player wants to advance that as fast as he can because that brings in the Prussians, and the, the French player is trying to... Um, keep that from, you know, doesn't want that to happen because obviously they want more time to defeat the British before the Prussians arrive. Now essentially both sides are trying to gain victory points. They, they gain victory points by either destroying enemy units altogether or if they can occupy certain spaces on the board that give them victory points. Now after you finish with your, your actions, your impulses, you go to a victory check phase. You see if the French or the British player has met their conditions by getting a total of 10 victory points, uh, either through, as I say, destroying the enemy or occupying those victory point spaces. But if one side succeeds in getting 10 victory points by that victory point check phase, then that player wins Waterloo, Napoleon's last battle. So Waterloo, Napoleon's Last Battle. This is um, a very interesting system that has a lot of really cool things going on. Now, I just scratched the surface. There are a ton of rules I didn't get into. I just didn't have time for. Um, but a lot of really interesting things going on here in this game. Um, kind of the way you do the attacks where you just take the lead attack factor and then you, you get the different things where you add in attack points or defense points you know based on the chart I think that's a pretty interesting system and I and I like that um, for me though the real highlight of this game is that core system that idea if you're activating the core and then all the units that match that core can move can attack I thought that was really interesting and 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 um, thematic how you're activating the core here really like that quite a bit probably my favorite thing about this game now, there's a lot of other things you can do with the commanders I didn't really get into. And they can do some fun things throughout the game as well. Um, Napoleon's Grand Battery can be interesting, how you're trying to take those indirect shots. Um, there's a lot here I like, but there, this game is probably in my upper level of complexity just because there's a huge learning curve, and there's so much going on. And it seemed, like, it seemed to me this game... As elegant as it is in some areas, it could have been refined in others. Um, I, I kind of felt like it, it did get a little bit messy at times. It did get a little bit um, unwieldy at times. Um, the game looks like it's a pretty simple, straightforward game, but there's a lot of minutia and a lot of exceptions and a lot of little things here and there that kind of, kind of weigh it down for me. Um, I, what I did like, though, too, is I think the game really captures the feel of the battle. The battlefield looks good. The, the, like I said, the core and the way the units act feels really good. You know, I've, I've, I did it my, uh, uh, one of my minor fields for my PhD was Napoleonic history. I wrote a big paper on Waterloo, so I'm really fascinated with this battle. And uh, I really, really uh, like games that, that can capture the feel. And this one does. This one feels very thematic. It feels very much like you're fighting that battle. I mean, as much as you can on cardboard, right? But like I say, it's just still, having said that, it's just a little too fiddly, a little too rulesy. Um, 
a lot of fun stuff here, a lot of fun stuff, but a lot of stuff that kind of bogged it down and kept me from really enjoying this game as much as I thought I might. Um, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to say try it before you buy it. Now, if you don't mind a little bit more of the complexity, you don't mind the, the learning curve, I think you'll really enjoy this one. If you're like me, it's, it's maybe it's worth checking out, but I don't know that it's one you got to own. Thank you once again for joining us today on The Discriminating Gamer. As always, we ask you to please leave a comment for us on YouTube, on Board Game Geek, on our Facebook page, or on thediscriminatinggamer.com. We ask you to please like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter. We are The Discriminating Gamer, and you know, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I've often wondered why Napoleon returned from exile in 1815, and I think I understand finally why. He needed more elbow room. Please somebody help me! again and I don't know where I'm going and I don't know where I've been please somebody help me on the solid ground it's a long time and I'll be dying once a year I wind up in the band oh there's a game oh what you play it for it's for having fun and learning about the gold war your mind like a mental pack of sharks will be putting people in a place like Karl Marx spreading influence across the globe in one of the best stories ever told Twilight Struggle Play it on the double Communist troubles In Twilight Struggle Some Jews would rather stay home with their girlfriends and snuggle But I'd rather go and play Twilight Struggle uh -oh -oh -oh.